Welcome to the World Builders Anvil, episode 273, Get a Job. Don't know where to start building your fantasy world? Do you need more? Does it make sense? Forget any worries and become a crafter of imagination. This is the place where we will prime your mind. Now, it's time to heat up the forge, break out the mithril ingots and hammer. Welcome to the World Builders Anvil. I'm Jeffrey W. Ingram. And I'm Michael Miller. Let's sup from the muck of Java and build. Welcome back. As always, I'm the clueless Jeffrey W. Wingram. Hey. And gainfully employed, I am Michael Miller. Gainfully employed, that's really good. Absolutely. You got to get out there and get a job. You know who doesn't have a job? Jeff. Jeff does not have a job. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't worked in over 52 years. You work for the man. <laughs> Who's the man? You're the man. I'm the man. <laughs> I'm the man. Okay. So I have this idea for an episode. I'm sitting there and I'm thinking about classes for the role-playing game I'm I'm working on. Not and, to be confused with the tabletop session that we were that we are also working on. No, this is a completely different story game. If you go and, back an episode or two, we talked about uh, Jeff doing a, a video game and you know stuff that we were brainstorming about that. So this is more on that side. And so I, I, I'm kind of trying to think about from a world building perspective. You know, obviously I played role-playing games, so the idea of classes is is in my brain and probably not in the right way. You know, the idea of, well, there's a fighter and there's a rogue and there's a bard and there's a magic user or whatever the classes are, you know, they have some certain uh, utilitarian function within the game, um, but they don't necessarily, uh, 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 they're generic. Uh, and so I wanted uh, I wanted my classes to feel a little more authentic well, to, to the culture. I'm, I'm wait, 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 wait. D define what you mean by generic because those are all specific. Like the point of a class is that they're specific. They're generic in the sense of a fighter is a fighter irregardless where he comes from within a world setting. Uh, a paladin's a paladin irregardless. I know they've tried to do stuff in the later years where they've tried to do that. Now, in, in systems like GURPS, that's not true. Uh, uh, because there's, well, there's no classes, mm. but, uh, but in like old school D and D, you know, a fighter is a fighter. It doesn't matter where it comes from. You might use a different weapon, which you wouldn't because the game will tell you based off of damage, what weapon you're going to use, uh, because it's, you know, it's to fit within a, a system. And, and so when I was thinking about classes, I'm like, is there a way I could abstract this back to world building? Because even as a world builder, you can take advantage of classes in a way because you have different classes of people. And I don't mean that in a social structure sense, but more in a sense of, um, um, of, of different groups of people. And, and so, uh, but in a way, if you have an idea of what groups of people there are, that might tell you what kinds of factions there are within a society. Those, uh, but those also tell you, uh, if someone's from a certain class, what do they do? You know, and so I kind of have classes for people in my world, um, and uh, just so I can think about them. If they're a farmer, there are certain things that they know inherently. If they are a warrior, th there might be certain things they know, all, and it's all dependent upon which culture they're involved in. And playing games at like GURPS kind of lead you more to this because you typically buy buy skills and stuff and so you kind of have groups of them put together in sort of semi-class like structures uh templates i believe they uh were, were called uh, but the I idea is i like it for world building in general because you know if you have a warrior who becomes emperor he has a different background than most emperors would have uh different skills different experiences and and so i like to think about people as in you know it's like you have this mold that you're made from but then your individuality makes you who you are and so that's kind of how I like to use classes and world building. Um, and then I like to make them culturally appropriate. So a, a, a Bedraken fighter will not fight the same as a Shiftarian fighter who will not fight the same as a um, Siren fighter. It's similar and, and the purpose is the same, but um, they have different ways and techniques of doing it. So it sounds to me like you're talking more like um, 
subclasses like like race you, you, you could define them that way that would be more of a hierarchical decision on how you build them mm-hmm. but yeah so it's like well, is that what you want to do or uh, it, it could be and and I, i'm not so sure on the limitations of the software i'm using either uh so there might be multiple warrior classes or there might be a warrior class with subclasses uh it depends on what is easier from a a creation standpoint inside of the uh, software that I'll be using. Um, But as a, as a whole, it's irrelevant uh, because this is a little more abstracted back to uh, what is essentially what is a class, which is just a a common set of skills. Um, And you'll find like, if you go like medieval Europe, um, a baron who lived on land, who did a lot of farming would have a lot of those skills uh, in addition to some additional fighting skills that uh, the peasants wouldn't have, the peasants would probably have some more specialized agricultural skills because they're doing all the work. Mm. Um, but uh, th- that's kind of uh, makes it a little bit more cloudy. So I don't want to kind of go quite to that level. But, um, you know, there are a few things I like to think about when I look at, at cultures to dissect them. You know, and first of all, is how do they fight? Because typically when you're talking about, classes a lot of times you think about how you engage in combat and in general uh the bedrack culture who i'll be looking at today is really really good at fighting they're a warrior culture so it's kind of inherent um they're they're uncivilized too so there isn't like a lot of scholars in the period of time that we're at they're they're not um, oh, okay in, based on time period i was gonna say they're not civilized yeah no no they are not and let's say when you've played them they've started uh really incorporating a lot more into cities but up to this point, uh, they've really not been. It's like even if you look at the Citadel from the map that you're engaging in, which is a little bit before uh, the story for the video game, uh, that uh, you know is actually outside of the city. So it's a fortress set, set near a city. And later on, the city will actually kind of grow out, and this will be the uh, edge of the city uh, in the future. But at this period of time, it's outside the city because – uh, one, there's some issues for living inside of cities. Um, they're dirty. Uh, people live really too close together. Uh, but you know, there's some benefits for having them. So, um, but in general, uh, the lords live in manors outside of cities, and um, and uh, there are people who live in cities because there are cities, but they're relatively small this time too. They're really not too big. Um, you know, probably the largest city in in the entire area is probably like 20,000 people. Which you think about in the scope of like today, mm. that seems really small. small. Like I, I live in a town of Windsor, which is larger than that. Mm-hmm. Um, but back then, I mean, you had to have a very heavy attrition to live in the city. There was a financial reward if you could make it work, but you're more likely to die from disease. Um, Living in a so, city? Yeah. Oh, yeah, back. Oh, yes. Most definitely. Just because once a disease hits the city, it spreads. Oh, yeah. That's true. It yeah. spreads like wildfire. Yeah, yeah. And without the necessity of you know doctor or like real. You no, know, you have the black death go through a county, and, and if no one comes to your little hamlet, it will never reach there. Um, so, um, you know, living the country life in, in a way is much safer uh, from a disease standpoint, which is probably still the most likely thing to kill you. Um, but uh, the first thing I like to think about is how do they fight? You know, and also like in their cultural norms, the Bedrakum are, they have clans within them. So there are groups of people who self-identify and, and have a little more similarities, but each of those are warrior too. And we've talked about in the past, they're actually based off of weapon types. Um, the, the, uh, each clan is essentially based off of the preferred weapon of the clan. Um, I like this idea. We'll, we'll kind of go into that. That's kind of based off of um, uh, old, like post-Roman Empire Europe. Like the Franks were called the Franks because uh, it was the style of axe was like a uh, Francesca axe, or I don't know how you would say it, but it was because of the name of their weapon is how the name of the 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 group got determined. So really, France is named after uh, ancient medieval axe. Um, so uh, keep that in mind. That's mm. names typically come from very utilitarian uh, reasons. Typically, something they're known for, something they do, or where they live. Um, oh, that makes sense. Yeah, people not being very original when it comes to how to identify a given thing. <laughs> exactly. That they're not previously familiar with. We 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 call them uh, uh, the. We call them the, the, We call them the Reds. Why? 
All red hair. That's right. All red hair. They're, they're the Reds. They are the, the Reds. The Russ. The Reds. <laughs> the Rus. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, uh, what do you call them? Uh, the, the hairy northern men. Why? Well, they're hairy northern northern men. And they're very hairy. Good goodness. Do you see how goodness. hairy they are? <laughs> Freaking cousin it over there. <laughs> um, you know, and also because it's fantasy and I magic my world, I think about how's magic performed. Are there ways of doing it in, in uh, the world? But Dracum, I have a very specific style of magic called carving magic. Mm. And I uh, really enjoy your concept of carving magic. It's one yeah. of my favorite things. Um, and what about holy men? Um, and the Dracum, you know, it's not holy men are different, and the, and the way religion works is different than what we do today. Uh, you, you don't have priests in your town um, in this period of time. Um, they live in the countryside. You go to them. You look for them. They're what you would call a seer. They see into the future. You probably you don't even want to hear what they have to say. It's probably really bad. Um, it'll probably make you want to go off and get in a fight and die because it's better than what's uh, going to come to you. Um, because it's just a it's a tough religion, and um, and so but uh, they're seers. They live out in the wilderness. The holy people do. They don't live. They're typically more hermit-like than, uh, you know, uh, there are a few places where there are congregations of them, uh, monastery-style places. But even those, they're strictly the holy people that live there. Not, uh, they don't, people might, might go there for, for big rituals, but in general, they stay away. Because you don't want the holy man, the crazy holy man, uh, seeing something bad in your future. So, mm -hmm. um in general, you know, most religions performed in your actions every day. You know, there's a ritual when you wake up where you make a sacrifice to the God of the hearth. So if any people come by, uh, uh, they, uh, you know, that's your first hospitality step. You know, you've prepped the hearth for visitors. <clears throat> and visitors are a very important thing in the dragon culture. Did we skip a note or did I miss you saying it? Um, I feel like there's something important that, that was up there that we didn't cover where it says what jobs are needed to be done to survive. Yeah. That's most classes in your society. Okay. You know, and it's the irony is a lot of times we look at cultures and stuff through their history. The problem is their history is, you know, about one tenth of 1% of the people who lived in the culture, you know, it's about the Kings, it's about the great generals, mm. um, but most life, uh, you know, you know, uh, it, as technology grows, that becomes less true. But, you know, pre-easy to write things down, um, most people will be forgotten what they do. But most jobs are farmers. They're uh, laborers. They are, uh, they are unskilled or, uh, or very based, survival-based jobs. You know, you farm because you need the food to live. You hope for extra. And if you get extra, you will try and trade for something else um, or maybe save it up for the future, depending on, on who you are. But in general, it's more of a fight for survival. Have you uh, ever, uh, very quick aside, uh, have you ever watched the movie The Witch? No. Watch the movie The Witch. And everybody listening, watch the movie The Witch. I know. Uh, my homework here would be to go watch The Holy Grail. <laughs> did, I told it. Wait, did I say it on the show last episode uh, about the um, about uh, the passion and the Holy Grail? I think so. We talked about it, so I don't know if it was on the show. I just can't that. remember if it was on the show. And all right, a quick a secondary quick aside. Um, I have a friend who uh, works at the. Uh, I think I did say it's on the show where he works at the um, Hungarian Austrian club and. Uh, they were going, they do a movie night every so often and he shoots me um, invites to them. And, uh, cause I'm a huge movie buff and I used to work in the industry. Um, and they were going to do passion of the Christ, but some of the people thought it was going to be a little too violent for kids. Cause they were going to have, you know, some kids sometimes come, the parents will bring their children. So they were like, Oh, well let's do the Holy grail instead. And I'm like, really? <laughs> <laughs> like that's your second choice. I mean, the, the irony was, um, the specific scene I'm thinking about is the scene where uh, they go to the, uh, uh, I forget what they call it, the commune, uh, where they're looking for the Lord of the land and they get assaulted by someone for uh, uh, being king. And, and there's, a, there's a huge political debate 
and bow. You know, you don't become an emperor because some sass <laughs> throws some a, a moist, scimitar at you. Moistened beats, heaved a scimitar at me. They, they put me away. They call me dumb. <laughs> exactly. But <laughs> we were talking about this in my history class in college, and the professor was like, probably looking at peasants in the Holy Grail is the most authentic representation that he's seen of them. Probably. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's sp seen specifically so um so uh you know most jobs are that it's like the idea where you talk to people who have past lives and i i i am not purposely poo pooing the idea i obviously can't know if it's real or not i don't necessarily believe it but who knows maybe they're right but the i just, I just like, most people i just, I just like when past lives it's like i was Napoleon, or I was mm -hmm. Caesar, or I was someone who we've heard of. When most of us were probably just serfs. Most of us were probably serfs. That's right. Yeah. The the, the thing that cracks me up is, is like, Ooh, he's probably king. Oh, what makes you think that? He's got shit all over him. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> oh uh, my god, I love my Python movies. So now you know. Once I think about uh, going back to the episode, how they fight, how his match performed, uh, what are holy men and. Are there any gaps that might be needed, right? Uh, and, and the fighting style of the Draca missile weapons are used, uh, but it's not necessarily, you know, considered. Uh, they had missiles. Good style, uh, ranged weapons. Do I need to use simpler <laughs> terms for you, Michael? <laughs> you always need to use simpler <laughs> terms for me. <laughs> um, but uh, uh, but they're not like it's not it's not honorable way to fight, but it's kind of essential in warfare. So uh, peasants are typically conscripted to do that kind of labor, but that's, that would be another class uh, within, um, you know, um, thing as peasants who are specialized and, and probably slings uh, would be really big, probably uh, sling staffs. Yeah, but how, can you, how big of a rock can you really throw with a big slam? Uh, well, you, you shape them. Um, they're pretty big. Yeah. You see what, see what I did there? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And, um, <laughs> I'll, I'll show you but later. Slings were probably really big. <laughs> I'm sorry. I just, <laughs> all right, moving um, on. But, but slings are were probably, I mean, even really in earth, they're an underrated weapon. Uh, oh yeah, definitely. You know, just because of the cost of the ammunition, bows are a way to show off wealth more than um, mm. uh, arrows are very difficult uh, to uh, mass produce, uh, expensive. Um, that's why you I know, think I think it was we uh, should do that. We should we should have a bit where you know we do characters that are craftsmen. It's like, what are you? I'm an arrow maker. That's all mm. I do. I make arrows. I make arrows. There is a, a, a arrow show. <laughs> Where do you think the name came from? Well, I um, never thought yeah. about where the name came from until this very moment. A high smith would have been someone whose family was like very skilled at smithing. Well, especially um, because yeah. it's spelled the way old, when you think of old school aeronautics as opposed to medieval weapon. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, arrow. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, you, you figure uh, angle is ingle is angle. You know, I mean... Who knows how to spell things anymore? Are you trying to confuse me? There was a great vowel exchange in the Middle Ages. So the way things are spelled, so a lot of times, like, if you know someone who's an English. sorry, did you say vowel? You say vowel? Is yes, that as you're a trying to say? linguistic vowel. vowel, yeah. What? A linguistic vowel. No, it sounds like you're saying vowel, V-A-L. No, I'm not. Maybe you're shooting for vowel, which is V-O-W-E-L. Yes. Uh, you don't need all those letters. I'm just trying to say that it doesn't sound. I do not think you. <laughs> I do not think you know what it means. It just doesn't sound like you're saying what you're saying. Inconceivable. Thank, um, thank you. Exactly. That's what I was going for, and I was getting tongue tied. <laughs> so one of the things I like to think about with my cultures are what are the skills that people use a lot within the big common groups. Um, you know, also where is the importance? Farmers are really important even though there there's a lot of them. So individually they don't have a lot of power, but their job is important. Uh, warriors, because it, it's a warrior culture that kind of tells you that, that they're important. Uh, like nobles are from warrior families of the past. So, um, you know, and, 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 and over time, their family just sort of keeps the, the, the title of being a, a certain level of noble, uh, unless they could take a better one. 
um, a better title. But you know, what are the, the common skills involved? You know, and I, I'm not going to go into all of the skills for all of the different classes here, but you know, just understand that it's more to it than a, a, a fighter knows how to use a sword and a rogue knows how to use a dagger. Uh, now, some games that might be all you need to know, but for world building, since they're a little bit more rounded, if you're doing a game like GURPS, obviously there's going to be a lot more skills involved. Um, um, but now, um, you know, so once I think about what are the common skills, and then I think about the groups like holy men, the 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 forgotten people, the the people who fill gaps, support characters as they're called in modern gaming. Um, uh, how's magic performed? You know, how do the people fight? And when looking you, at the Petraki culture, hang, I start coming up with a few things. Go ahead. When you say support character, are you referring to uh, classes? Like uh, classes that, that are. That was my reference was to like a support class. You know, <clears throat> you know, uh, that comes from the idea that you're filling holes that, that need to be serviced, you know, in a game. But the idea is like, for my world, ranged people are really a support. Uh, role because it's it's not done typically, so it's it's not like a lifelong profession for anyone. So some people are just good at it. Um, range combat, range combat, yeah. Okay. So, uh, but that's more of a support style of of role in my world. But you know, I think about other kinds of games. They have what they call support characters, and they're really filling the gaps that the game needs to be filled to mm-hmm. be able to work in teams to accomplish stuff. Mm-hmm. That's what I. That's the distinction I kind of yeah. wanted to get to. So I'm glad you clarified it. So uh, <clears throat> looking at the Pedrakan culture itself, I've talked about this a few times. There are seven. Uh, there are seven clans in Pedrakan. Well, there really, it's not quite that, but there are seven classical clans uh, to the culture. Uh, there is the Luton. Uh, they are axe. Everyone from this culture group knows how to use an axe. Uh, if you're a wizard. <laughs> you know how to use an axe because you grew up uh, learning to use one. <laughs> because you grew up having axes thrown at you. That's right. <laughs> uh, uh, th- this is more of a hand style axe, uh, a little bit too big to throw. You could throw it, but uh, it's not weighted well for throwing because there's also the Eklutum, which is small axe. And that's actually an axe designed more of like what you think of as like a Norse style uh, um, hatchet. You know, mm-hmm. it's small. It's like it's designed to spin in the air. It's actually, but it's actually a separate clan. Um, I have something like that. I got to work on it. There's the Hiram. Uh, that's actually the name for a sword. So okay. here is sword, sword people. Uh, there's a clan that just use broadswords. They're very pragmatic. Um, there are Ooh, the. Hang on, hang on. I want uh-huh. to acknowledge, now we get acknowledge something that's kind of funny there because you're usually a proponent of. Don't name a thing a different thing if the thing exists. But I, in the game, did you? Hang on, did you name Hiram or is that an actual word? That's a, a word I came up with. So you but made that up. Okay. I, made, I made that up, but the idea was like it, in stories, I'll never call a sword that. But the thing was, I, I use those kind of words to build nouns. So like the, Okay. I want the clan name to be named after their sword. Oh, so the, so Hiram is the name of the clan, not the weapon. It, technically, a hear would be the weapon, but okay. if you ever interacted in my fiction, it would never be called that. But the word was developed because I needed it to, to create the clan name because I knew I had this clan. Fair enough. Fair enough. Yep. And it's like look is axe, but if you ever interact in my fiction, I'll never call it that. You'll but the clan is called Lutum. Gotcha. Um, and that's for flavor. Um, we do like flavor. The Ventrac uh, Care uh, I have no idea how to say that one. <laughs> I mixed up the stupid. Did I, did I mention I developed this language? <laughs> yeah, you can't expect me to know how to say it. <laughs> it's a really long word, but essentially it means long spear, uh, long spearman. Uh, that's really what it means. It's a pike pit. Well, some, some men are longer than others. Well, this clan is the long clan. That's the whole V word up front. Because there's another clan where you take the V word off, the spearmen. That's a different clan. They're smaller, though. Ventric. It's a rival. Ventriquirium. Uh, Ventriquirium. Ventriquirium. K, K, the Q's of K. Okay. Curum. They trek quirum. 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 K, curum. Curum. Yep. They, they trek quirum. Mm-hmm. 
Correct. Ben Trekurum and Trekurum, um, which are the spearmen, and then the Balfkurum, which are essentially a pole arm people. So they have pole arms. Not enough pole arms. They have a pole arm, but specifically, it's axe on one side, a pick on the other side. Um, yeah, not not enough pole arms, not enough spears. Mm-hmm. <laughs> underrated weapons. Yeah, yes, and this is very underrated because essentially. You can slash with it. You can stab with it. It's mm-hmm. a, actually a very effective weapon. They actually they believe the idea of a war scythe, uh, you know, the Grim Reaper scythe. Mm-hmm. Will think that they they used in combat probably came from a pickaxe polar. Mm. I saw that in a YouTube video, <clears throat> so it must have been true. Must have. Um, well, we talked about spears being being underrated and, mm-hmm. and underused. Like, I mean, it's such a great weapon. It keeps you out of arm's reach, which, mm-hmm. which is excellent. And, and actually, the clan that fights with them here don't fight with them in a traditional sense. Like, people think of a spear fighting like spears overhead. They actually fight with it more pole arm style, or more uh, mm-hmm. uh, staff style. So the, they fight with you like it's staff, and mm-hmm. then they can stab and kill you uh, more effectively than a staff fighter could. Uh, you want to watch some really good spear fighting. Watch the anime Mora B2 and watch um, Spell that for me? Uh, not right this second. Okay. Uh, actually, it's actually not that hard. It, it's like um, Don't don't try. Mora, M-O-R-I-B-I-T-O I'm almost positive that's correct. You only ever do what I say when I really don't mean it. Yeah, but you know I don't listen to you very often. So uh, more B2 and then uh, for some fantastic Roman spear fighting, watch Troy. Like they actually did an amazing job in that movie making the spear fighting look like what you know Roman spear fighting should be as opposed to I, I'm sorry, Greek. As opposed to um, well, there's spears in the in this and you know, cinematically making it look like Kung Fu would be awesome. Mm-hmm. Which is more often what they do. It's like, oh, it's like kung fu spear fighting. It's like, no, no, that's not how they fought at all. Yeah, so it was yeah. much more brutal in your face. Yeah, um, yeah, uh, that was actually a very enjoyable movie. I enjoyed it. Oh, uh, it's fantastic. Movie. Um, and then those are sort of the warrior classes that will be there. And so essentially, is if you pick someone, and I, I don't know if I will if I'll only have one name for the class, but they'll have a, a special weapon or if it will be a subclass of warrior, I don't know. Um, but essentially, it, it, you know, as you acquire clans under your command, warriors will become available with different weapons. Different weapons have different uh, things that make them good or bad. Um, I hope, and if I balance it correctly, you'll kind of like, I don't have enough characters in my party because I want this and I want this. I don't, I don't know what to do. And, um, and then, you know, you know, you, it'll give you the ability to, to tweak for areas to go, well, these uh, pickaxes will work better here, or these swords will work pretty good everywhere or axes will work really good here. You know, I kind of want that kind of dynamic with it, but it'll be uh-huh. basically based off of when you acquire uh, dominance over clans, uh, I, I want to open up warriors with the different weapons. Now, in theory, you know, in, in real life, anyone can pick up an axe and use it. That's one of the beautiful things with axes. But obviously, for limitations of the game, it'll be limited to, you know, you can only use an axe because you're from this clan. Uh, well, what if you... If you were tabletop with me, I wouldn't be that way. I mean, there's... Is there no way for to, to just build in, like, a difficulty modifier? Like, okay, if you're... Uh, Whatever allows you to distinguish one character from another, whether it is like sure. if, if you're part of a that. clan, and I'm one person working on this, so it's not gonna. I, I, it's just not where I want to spend the effort. Fair so, enough. Yeah. Well, my point. My here's what I'm thinking, and I'm wondering if this would be easily done. If you were part of a class, then there's a layer of distinctions. To make it like anybody can use a weapon, but if if you're part of a class, then that weapon you get a big bonus on. Well, that was actually that was actually one of my thoughts was to actually make um, the the clans essentially the class, and then make um, uh, your 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 specialization a subclass. So you're yeah. an axe warrior. You're an axe uh, if you're the Lutton, but you're a carver because it would be because like in my game, carvers would use the same weapons. Um, you know, uh, they probably uh, as their clan. So it kind of makes sense to do that, and that's kind of mentally where I'm leaning mm-hmm. um, to make your job a sub thing. So I can use an axe, but I'm a I'm a slinger. You know, I'm an axe because of my clan, but I'm a slinger because I sling. 
Hmm. That's one of the things that I do really like about. And though I might just use a bow in the game because it's. Uh, 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 I don't know if I'll be able to get a hold of assets of uh, spear or um, not spear, but uh, uh, staff slings or um, slings. Uh, but who knows? It, it depends on the assets available too. Uh, but more likely in this culture, it would be javelins, uh, throwing axes, or. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, javelins. You mean Jav- javelins? No javelins. Okay. It is a different thing. Well, I changed the name after after uh, 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 checking out Anthem. I don't like using that word anymore, so I changed the word. Oh, why is javelin a big thing in Anthem? That's the armor. Oh, gotcha. That's a cool name. It's a, yeah, but the game's really bad. What? <laughs> is it? Is it? I, really that's bad? what I heard. I heard there's like really slow. I heard, I heard like the core gameplay is really cool, but the loot. I just not. heard that. I've just heard that the you know it's got some uh, some some. What do you call it? Uh, not growing pains, but like, you know, it's the, the starting initial pains. Some starting pains. Like yeah. they released the game. They took six years to develop a game. They should have taken eight years to develop. <laughs> but before I heard like the loose really bad in the game, which for that style of game is really, really bad. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's, it's like, it's like say, okay, Michael, I'm going to have you play Destiny, but we're not going to allow you to get new weapons. Uh, and yeah, I, I mean, Unless you pay, obviously. They 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 made a huge mistake when they released Destiny 2. And I've talked about this before. Mm-hmm. And they've corrected it because yeah. they're like, yeah, you know what? That was a mistake. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, and when they first released Destiny 2, all of the weapons had static perks. Mm-hmm. And in Destiny 1, any given weapon had dynamic perks. It could grow Except with you. Except- no, no, not that it could grow with you, but it's but if a game if a weapon dropped randomly, if it wasn't an exotic weapon or if it oh. wasn't a curated weapon. So if you picked up an M4, your M4 might have all its base stats would be the same as my M4, but you'd have a bunch of randomized um, Got you. perks. So yours might have a bonus to stability and a, a bigger magazine, but mine might do more damage. At and in theory, range. it makes getting the same thing over and over again less annoying. Exactly, because every now and then, because people would grind for a specific like. Every now and then they would have – there'd be like, here's a cool pulse rifle that you can only get in this one area of mm-hmm. the game and it, only if you beat this one boss. Mm-hmm. And people would farm that boss. They'd play that boss. Like when that strike came up that week, they would just play that boss over and over and over again on the hope mm-hmm. that they would, one, randomly get that weapon because it wasn't a guarantee. And two, that they would get a good version of that weapon. Mm-hmm. And if it wasn't a good version, they would just keep killing that boss yeah. over and over and over again until they got a really good version of that gun. Yeah. And that was one of the things that gave the game massive replay- playability. Yeah. Like, they took that away at the beginning of Destiny 2. And they very quickly realized their error because in a month, everybody had every weapon and, were, and became bored and complained. Yeah, no. and that's kind of what I heard with because in, in Anthem the big thing is armor, and so from what I heard is armor is really the thing that you want the most, and the weapons don't seem to make a difference in how they hurt people, and actually they, they've done math to figure out that some of the base weapons do more damage than some of the like they're really they're super hoopty weapons, um, w- which seems to be a bug I would hope, but mm. um, but like the armor is like there aren't that many sets even if you spend money, they just for whatever reason that they've chosen to hold back a whole bunch of the assets. So, um, uh, yeah, people are frustrated. So, uh, that's our little video game note of the day. Uh, But that's why, that's why they're javelons and not javelins. That's right. That's right. And, um, (laughs) on top of that, there are two specific classes that are good with missile weapons, um, that are, um, that aren't, typical peasantry there are hunters uh, and those people who essentially go out and they 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 do long range long range hunting not short range hunting around their village but they actually spend their life in more rugged areas hunting gathering probably for furs as much as meat so like a ranger well, well more like a, a a beaver hunter but they're hunting like you know stuff that's around them like more like a beaver trapper would like a furrier or a trapper yeah exactly um and bandits you know bandits are an underutilized thing and uh even in ancient cultures that had strong authoritarian powers between cities were really dangerous to travel because there were bandits everywhere because hey if i can't get a job and i don't have a place to stay i'm going to go get with these group of thugs and we're going to start doing so there's actually bandits all over um and so there are people who i would classify as a bandit it's a slightly different skill set 
than, than a hunter. It's a slightly different skill set than a warrior. Mm. Um, a little bit more of a support step sort of my, my rogue. Um, sailors, uh, I probably won't have any in the game. They make very little sense. Uh, but on the ocean side, there are people who know how to use boats. Um, Carver, and I'm not sure if I can implement magic the way I want to in the game. Uh, but I'll have to see what kind of compromise they do. I don't want it to be exactly the same as this is my fire spell. This is my group fire spell. Uh, if I can do it the way I want to, what it will be is you have like a thing for target foe or target all foes. And then that's one turn. And then the next turn is fire. So, you know, you can, you can cast fire on the foes or if you cast it on yourself, it's like a fire shield. I don't know if I can pull that off or not. So there might just be generic spells, but um, I want it layered, which would be, be more realistic. Mm. So it takes a couple turns to do something, but then the, the, that, that turn it goes off, it's much more powerful than it would be if, if it was a one turn type of spell in a normal uh, JRPG. Uh, but that's to sort of symbolize the idea where they would literally typically carve it out in, in real life. And then that's how they expend magic. So, um, uh, so I want to try and synthesize that if possible in the game, but that would be a class here and seer seer would cast magic more in the traditional way you think of because it's through the gods. So, um, if I could do it right, there'll be a couple different seers for different gods they'd have a different spell group but it'd be more like a traditional uh, magic user in a jrpg where uh they cast fire or lightning or more elemental type of stuff and it's more like cause and effect uh now in theory the way it works in 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 my game world is the spells happen because of the gods allowing it to happen Mm-hmm. And um, and so, like, if you upset your god, you would lose your magic, or you go, I cast a fireball on the group of children, and you know, you're like, you know, uh, a priest for the uh, god of kind and goodness up towards children would be like, uh, you're my priest. No, you can't do that, and it just wouldn't happen. I mean, is that something that you think you could actually program? Though that sounds like yeah. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't know if I would, or if there if there will be those kind of situations to even worry about here. So in, 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 in version one where I'm learning different things, definitely probably not going to worry about it, but that was more of a class explanation more than a, you know, uh, it's quicker magic, but the prices, it might not go off in a world building sense. Well, maybe you could do something where, um, uh, like two or three times throughout the game, there could be a story choice. Yeah, and yeah. If you choose to do something that goes against your god, then that character. No you can longer... lose a character even though they're still there. Essentially, or maybe not lose the character, but that character can no longer cast, cast magic. magic. So yeah. you could be your favorite magic caster, but if you do something that goes against your god, then all of a sudden they yeah. lose half their abilities. That, that'd be one way to bring the culture into the game without actually having a hard mechanic hardwired in the game, and that'd be the more likely way it would show up if it does. Um, I think I just created an awesome idea for you. Maybe you did. That sounds like a pretty good idea to me. And now high nobles. Um, high nobles where they start managing different nobles. And that there's actually a skill set involved in that. And so to me, that's different than, you know, a knight, uh, which would be like one of the just normal warriors. So um, there's a high noble class as well, too, because they, they have a lot more management style skills. They, they know all the warrior stuff, probably not as good as the... Uh, uh, guys who, who who spend more time fighting, but they have a little bit more on the management side. And then merchants. Uh, there are two major kind in Bedrakum Rivermen and Teamsters. Rivermen will definitely be important and, 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 and Teamsters. Uh, uh, probably not so much, but Rivermen, because there's a big lake in the middle of this county. Mm-hmm. Rivermen uh, do most of the trading. And there's actually story reasons why they'll they'll be very important as well too, but uh, going through this, I do think I'm going to stick with like the, the class being your clan, which tells you what your base type is, and then underneath that have a subclass, which would be a riverman or a high noble or a seer. I do think that's the way it will work out in the end, uh, if I can do that. If not, it, it'll just cause me a lot more coding, which will annoy me, or a lot more. Uh, uh, designing, which will annoy me. So how it, how it, how is that? How is this um, RPG Maker? How are you, like which one is it? It's uh, RPG Maker MV, I believe. Um, it's pretty simple uh, from a techno. Uh, you don't wouldn't need to know how to code to use it. 
Um, knowing technology, I think, is beneficial to using it, though. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, n- knowing like, okay, there are lots of plugins that can be applied to it. And mm-hmm. so I'm kind of going through right now trying to find, you know, if the core game isn't great or doesn't have a feature I want, has someone made that reusable for me already? Mm. So, um, which would be awesome. There's a group called the Yanfly. I don't know if that's a group or if that's a person's name. I'm not sure yet, but this guy seems to just chuck out plugins for the thing. So uh, he's actually solved several things that I want to do, though. Is it open source? Uh, the RPG Maker itself, I don't believe is. I don't believe it's open source. Um, it's, but it's a low cost product to get into. I forget, like I bought off of steam for like mm-hmm. 60 bucks with a whole bunch of assets, like, um, characters and models and stuff like that with it. So mm-hmm. um, I remember it like, I wasn't 60 bucks. It was probably like 40 bucks. I don't really remember what the price was, but I, I wanted to take on this exact project, um, in like, gosh, it must've been right around 2001, somewhere around there. And I mean, it was really labor intensive to, 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 yeah. u- to use it. So I found very quickly that I was like, oh, and that was, I think, the original RPG maker. Yeah. Or it was, it was either the first one or the second one. Yeah. yeah and no, I was I, like, wow, I, this is probably it was cumbersome. Yeah, I'm I on mean, short. It, it here, and the thing I like about it, and, and more of the reason I'm going there is because this is not like where I'm professionally moving in life. Um, so uh, it, it's easier for me because there's a bunch of assets that you know I can – essentially purchase or <clears throat> that come with it that I'll be using or slightly modifying um, uh, to try and create some uniqueness uh, within the world. Um, because I just, I, I, you know, if I was probably doing, doing a game like this for real, where I was really trying to make money off of it, I'd probably look at something like unity, but then <clears throat> there's a bigger problem of acquiring the assets and, and getting them in. And there's a, a, a bigger technological uh, knowledge to doing it. But I believe it's like, what was a traveler occupath traveler, which is the style of a game which came out recently on switch. Uh, the first one in a really long time, actually that's come out. Um, that I believe was done in Unity as well. But the interesting thing is too, it's like you can think about, okay, is this going to be mobile first or is it you know, going to be for desktop? There, there might be some sense to try and make it a mobile game. And then the 99 cent game, you know, you know, or whatever, maybe I'll just give it away for free for, for my email list. I'm not sure. Or maybe a variety of those. But, uh, um, you know, uh, there are some in, actually interesting options. I don't know how well they work though. So, I have to look at that in the future, but um, yeah, no, I think it's a very interesting uh, uh, project to undertake. And and the the the, the, the big thing is, I, I want to get over to the people who are paying attention to this. Is when you think about a culture, or you know, think about it as it's a bunch of pieces that work together towards the cultural norms. So sort of think about, you know, you know, maybe they don't have a clan structure, so like. Uh, you wouldn't have a warrior thing set up the way I do, but there might still be a really, you know, a variety. There could be a wide variety of warriors, you know. If swords are illegal, you might end up with ninjas, people like more real life terms where they could take everyday implements and hide or turn them into weapons Mm. Uh, because the good stuff was illegal for a uh, non samurai in Japan. Mm. So they figured out how to make a straight sword so they could put it into a staff and hide it. You know, they learned how to use uh, scythes on the ends of chains, which, you know, impressive. If you've seen someone who knows how to do that, do that. Well, you know what's funny is the weapon that um, is used in the movie uh, Ninja Assassin mm. was actually a weapon they created for the movie. You'd look at it and you'd be like, oh, no, that's been in you know, ninja lore forever. No, not true. They made it for the movie. Maybe someone else came up with it previously, but they created it on their own. And the actor had to learn how to use this weapon that no one had ever tried to use before. Mm -hmm. And as the movie progressed, this guy trained with this thing like crazy. Mm -hmm. And they, they had to re choreograph upcoming fight sequences that they were going to shoot because they were like, Oh, he can do more things with this now. Oh, okay. Oh, that's so, cool. So they made it more complicated because he was t- teaching himself how to do things with this thing that were just really impressive visually. Mm. And and so like you see the stuff that he does in the movie, like most of it he's really doing. I mean, there's a lot of um, CGI augmentation in the action in that movie, mm-hmm. but there's a lot of the stuff that he's he's legit doing those moves. So 
It's impressive to watch. And, and it's literally, it's, it's, it's a knife with a chain at the very base of the, of the handle. So think of like when you see, you may have seen like chain weapons where it's literally just a chain and just a weight on both ends. Mm -hmm. Turn one of those weights into a knife. Mm -hmm. And that's what the weapon is. Yeah, no, I've, se I've seen like scythes used that way. Mm. But not like normal chain fighting though. Mm. I've seen them used, they're used a little differently. And the chain is more like a surprise kind of thing where it can get a lot further, but then get pulled back um, kind of device. But uh, yeah. No, very cool. So uh, your world building task for the day is to uh, look at your cultures and, 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 and think about the break them into buckets, as we'd say in the business world when we're looking at profits, right? You know, this bucket is, is uh, warriors. This bucket is magic. But what are the things that you need? Um, and from a world building sense, you're thinking about really broadly, like I said, it's survival type of stuff like farmer, laborer. That's most people. Now, mm. okay, that's 98% of the people. And the last 2%, what do I have to do? Um, in any agrarian society, most people are are those two things. Mm. Um, and, 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 and then just sort of break down what are the classes of your world. And if, if you're not using an RPG, you don't need to get very specific, but just think about what are the skills that they would all have in common? Because those are bonds, you know, it's, it's things that you have in common that you're good or bad with that uh, make you interact with other people, you know. So if I'm a farmer, but I, I don't know how to plow, the other mm. farmers are going to make fun of me. And that's why I become the bitter old man <laughs> in the chair, because people are making fun of me for my lack of farming skills. Um, or if you're just at that tech level and you don't know how to make a fire. <laughs> yeah. At certain tech levels, that might make you the ruler. So, I mean, who knows? Mm. Uh, oh, he can make a fire? Hey, he's in charge. Um, <laughs> so that's probably really, the, really low tech level. That's a really low tech level, yeah. Uh, but, you know, just think, take one of your cultures and, and sort of break them down into these buckets and then go, based off of the, the, the norms of the cultures, their beliefs, which of these are the important groups? You know, it's not going to always be the warriors are the most important. They'll always have some level of power, but they're not always the most important. They're not always even the rulers. Um, you know, the, the Iroquois, when they had first contact, it was actually the women uh, who were left behind in um, uh, to take care of the, the farms kind of became the most important person. And the warriors were important, but they weren't as important as this lady was. Mm. So, um, and it's just because of the division of labor and, and, and their specific culture drove things in a different way than what you normally think of when you think of ancient cultures. So the same about the way your culture views at things and that will help you come up with status, you know, well, farmers are really important. So maybe far, you know, like in ancient Rome, being a farmer was a very prestigious job. In you ancient know? Rome? Really? Oh yes. Yes. I mean, even up through the empire, being a farmer was what made you a real Roman, you know, because you'd go off the farm early on and join up the legion and go fight and return after the season to, to do, do your harvesting. But then after a while, when the empire got too big, uh, they couldn't make it back and their farms would, would collapse. And then the uh, senators would buy up all of the farmland from the soldiers while they're off away um, and uh, enslave. Sounds, sounds, sounds familiar. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you want to talk about you know, an inequitable society, uh, they, they had loads of that on us. So, um, uh, much worse, uh, to live in than where we do. So, uh, never look back for a better society than the ones that are around today, which says something, uh, <laughs> uh, but you know, do, do think about your cultures this way, you know, and, and because it helps you to me, this is where it starts to connect the pieces that, that really, can start bringing a, a, a unique flavor to society. You start learning how people should interact. You know, you look at what's important and what they do, and it tells you what types of weapons they'll use, what types of um, uh, people are important, all from knowing what is important to the culture and what things need to happen. So go ahead. At some point, I should put, just put together a list of things that need to happen in an ancient society and, and use that as a check of like a free giveaway or something. But I won't have time to get that done here. So uh, at this point, you have to do that homework, you know, for yourself. And you remember, it's fiction. So if you're not sure, just make it up. <laughs> um, uh, 
And for your, uh, I'm going to give this one to Michael. What is the real world task for today? <laughs> I love when you do give that to me with no warning whatsoever. And I know you love it too. Uh, let's see. Real world task of the day. Um, <clears throat> how about this? How about consider an old world skill that would actually be beneficial to know in uh, modern time and look into learning. it. Mm -hmm. um, I'll give you an idea. Something that I am really big on. Uh, something that led me to getting into knife, knife making was um, understanding uh, bushcraft skills. So bushcraft skills are basically uh, camping skills and survivors, survival skills. So literally, I know how to build a clay stove in the woods with no tools whatsoever. I know how to build a drill, a drill in the woods with no tools whatsoever. I can do that. I've never tested the knowledge, I'll admit, mm -hmm. but I know how to do it. Um, so does me trying to acquire the ability to put together an 8-bit video game count? Uh, no. I would say no. start start really small with something that you're interested in. Maybe something as simple as how to keep a house plant alive um, or possibly if you want to go a step further, growing some herbs in your kitchen or understanding how a compost works so that you can – uh, you know, create a compost in your backyard if you have one. Um, I had a friend who lived in a New York City apartment on like the seventh floor, mm -hmm. and she had an herb garden and a compost. She 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 built the compost in a windowsill. It was small, but she would, you know, let things disintegrate as opposed to just filling a landfill. Yeah, people would be shocked at the number of farm subsidies that go directly to uh, Fifth Avenue in Manhattan. Mm -hmm. um, so. Go to, D I mean, look at Detroit. You do any research on what's going on in Detroit, there's a ton, a ton of urban farming in Detroit. Mm -hmm. All right. So you guys have your real world tasks. So get out there and start farming. Uh, preferably do some yard work in my yard too. <laughs> Jeff has lots of yard work. Uh, so uh, if you can't think of anything else, come on over and I'll get you to work in my ear. So uh, have a good week and we'll talk to you next time. Thank you so much for listening to the World Builders Anvil. We would love it if you would share the World Builders Anvil with two of your friends. And so would they. If they are unfamiliar with podcasts, then you get to introduce them to the wonderful world of podcasting. Take them to Stitcher or iTunes, or best of all, just send them to our website, www.garduel.com. That's G-A-R-D-U-L.com. Now strike while the myth was hot.